Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of Podcast Pasta. That's a podcast that's like pasta, not the podcast that's about pasta. As always, I'm your host, Mike. And today I am joined with Ken. You are the host of See It For Yourself, a YouTube channel in which you do media reactions, media analysis. Uh, Ken, how are you today? I'm doing quite well. How are you, how are you today, Mike? I'm doing great. Um, Ken, you mentioned that you saw uh, some of my episodes uh, before coming on, so you probably know what I'm going to ask you next, but I gave yep. you a very brief introduction, I think admittedly briefer than some of my other guests, but if you want to mm-hmm. kind of expand on uh, that, I, I guess explain in your own words uh, what you do and what motivates the content that you create. Sure. Yeah, so what I do is I do reactions and reviews to movies and television. Um, and the motivation behind it is I love movies. I mean, honestly, that's really it. Um, before I was doing this, I would put little blurbs of my thoughts on different movies that I've seen uh, on like Twitter and Facebook and things of that nature. And essentially how I got here was, let me know if I'm <laughs> getting too far ahead of myself. But no, 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 um, essentially, yeah. essentially how I got here was a, a podcast reached out to me, a podcast I was listening to, um, a local Philly podcast called The Blurred Bar. Um, and they asked me if I wanted to be a part of that podcast and just kind of be like their movie guy. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then how it evolved into See For Yourself is we all like we all cover like different parts of media. Uh, like I said, I'm the movie guy. We have a comic book guy, uh, a anime guy, as well as a video game woman um, who all come together like Voltron, um, so to speak. And <clears throat> we cover our different corners of media. So the idea was to kind of like help grow the channel was that each of us would make individual content to pull in people from those different corners and that's how i got the idea for see for yourself um yeah and yeah and that's pretty much it so do you have a background in like um like media career like any type of like media creation like television and anything like that or are you covering purely from the perspective of a fan like giving a fan perspective yeah, purely from the pers- purely from the perspective of a fan. Um, I have no media training or anything of that nature. I mean, you should see when I do uh, recordings how long it takes me to say a single line. I have it typically takes me like forty minutes worth of recording to get like a five minute video out because I'm stuttering and so on and so forth. So yeah, no no media training at all. I'm just a big fan of movies, big fan of film. And, um, yeah. Well, I mean, you're talking to a guy that, uh, you know, does no scripting at all. So I'm just like the ramble king over here. I just started scripting, um, to help with the stuttering and organizing of my thoughts because beforehand, like I said, I have a, I have a video that ended up being 15 minutes. That was 45. Um, yeah, so it, it's a lot. So I, I have to script now so that I can save my editor uh, some some sanity and myself as well. Right, yeah, and, you know, um, I've told this, like, many times on the podcast, but I, I've always wanted to do, like, scripted stuff myself, like, even before, like, I began all this, but I just, I don't have the patience to proofread my own work Yeah, as a writer. Um, and also, no, I totally uh, get that. yeah, and also, like, uh, I'm like, I've been told I'm a very technical writer in the sense that like, I'm very like to the point and I don't think that's necessarily conducive to like, especially video essay, like works. Um, yeah. You mean like in terms of there needing to be like an entertaining factor in involved as well as like the technical factor? Yeah. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Cause um, I go through that as well. Um, even like with the, with the um, outside of the movie reviews, I do something called like general thoughts. And it's easy for me to get off my general thoughts. It's not easy for me to make it entertaining. <laughs> but that's, that's the hard part. Right. But I, I mean, in any case, I, I do, I, I enjoy, I think, like the kind of polish that you have 
with your content. Um, mm -hmm. and it almost feels like you're like an affiliate in a way, which I guess you kind of are, but, um, I don't know, like with the, because I imagine you you still consider yourself like independent, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. See for yourself, like even with us saying, Hey, we'll all come up with, you know, our own ideas for how to expect, I made it very clear, like see, see for yourself belongs to me. Like, so it's, it's in like, it's helping that podcast, but it's my baby essentially. You know, I don't really ask this question that often, but I guess I, I am curious then, um, considering mm -hmm. like, uh, honestly, the quality of your work, like what is the budget for your show? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, honestly, it's it's ten dollars here and ten dollars there. To be completely right, honest, so it's like you. a loose number. Oh yeah, like seriously, I have. I don't even know if I have a written budget. Um, a lot of it is, hey, we paid all the bills. Okay, cool. We put some money in savings. Can I spend this sixty bucks on this uh this softbox light that I found on Facebook Market? And that's that's literally how this thing gets me. <laughs> yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. No, no, I mean I'm in a similar way. Like if you ask me to like do the accounting for this show, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Like I, yeah, I spent exactly. like a lot of money on my mic and that's about it. I guess money for like the games for my B roll. Uh mm -hmm. the computer technically. I mean, I don't know. There's just a lot to factor in. So I, I get it. I was just, I was just curious if it was like something more cemented. For, for yeah. you all yeah the the funny thing is um i actually kind of had most of the equipment except for like the lighting stuff uh myself already so i'm a web developer i'm a programmer and um so i have a macbook and i have a webcam and i have um monitors and all this other stuff just for my job so all that stuff was kind of already here and then the stuff that I, that you'll see like in the, in the background of my videos that's just like a bunch of art I collected over the years and literally just put up this year, not even for the, the channel. It's just, Hey, this stuff is laying around on the ground. I have literal, literally frames of art laying around on the ground. My wife told me to do something with it. So I'm, I did something. With it. Yeah. Now I think from the content I was checking, you're like some of your more recent stuff is you're obviously covering uh, episode by episode of uh, I think it was Secret Invasion, right? The Disney Plus show. That's right. Yep. Um, and I, I guess um, it, it's convenient that I have you on because I have been, you know, I have done a few talks where I have discussed, you know, the state of like the MCU broadly. Sure. Um, and where I, I think it's going to go. Um, but I, I think you might have like more of a, I guess, how would I say, like firsthand knowledge, like directly engaging with like Marvel content. Right. Um, so I guess in your opinion, uh, are you satisfied with the direction Marvel's currently going? Um, I would say no at this moment, but I'm not in a panic mode to say it's all going to shit and it's all, all I'm sorry, can I curse on here? Fair enough. I, I think I'm like in a similar um, band camp where I, I think it's still like kind of, ah, it, it's weird to say, but like too big to fail, at least for the moment, you know, where mm -hmm. it suffered some losses, but I think overall they're still at the very least making money off these properties. Um, yeah. <clears throat> unfortunately I haven't had a chance to check out secret invasion. Um, and, uh, even though I have seen like brief glimpses of your content, I, I guess, uh, if I had to ask for your general overview, uh, what's do you like, are you enjoying it or what's, what's your take on it so far? So, so far secret invasion is probably my favorite thing Marvel has done in quite some time um i wouldn't say quite some time because it's not that, that dramatic but i'm thoroughly enjoying this show because it's delivering on what it promised which was a spy show uh espionage uh type of show um and because it's giving me exactly what it told me it would and because honestly the performances in the show from samuel l jackson ben, Mel ben mendelson 
and um, Kingsley Benadir, who um, I wasn't too familiar with him before he plays the main villain, uh, Gravik. I mean, the performances in the show are incredible. Beyond like the action and all this other stuff, the acting in the show is worth watching by itself. So I've thoroughly been enjoying the show. Um, yeah, so that's that's been my my take on it. Now, admittedly, I'm kind of hesitant to like get into it, partly because, um, well, for one, I'm just I've just never been interested in like that side of Marvel, if it makes sense. So, like, you know, the whole Captain America, like more espionage like stuff of it i've always been into like the doctor or um yeah doctor strange like the whole mystical arts type properties okay. i think yeah um, that makes sense but um i don't know I, like secret invasions felt like such a weird story to adapt now given like like the current political climate you know what i mean yeah absolutely um i think that we are definitely in a time of mass paranoia. Um, and this show is giving us exactly that. Um, just a little bit more, you know, um, uh, mythical, if you will, uh, with aliens and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, it's, I totally get where you're coming from. Um, even, uh, I'm not trying to, I will not give anything away, but the, the new Mission Impossible movie I saw that Monday night, and in a very similar fashion, it's all about paranoia and AI and, and different thing, things of that nature. So you have a lot of like really culturally relevant things going on right now in our media. Yeah, except the issue is I've never, I've never thought that Disney has done a good job of tackling like even like modern political issues. Like the example I would give is um, like the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Mm, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah. I just did not like it. I mean, the show itself is fine, I guess, like the performances mm -hmm. and everything like that. But um, I, it, it was like their coverage of like the topics of, you know, like racism, of like border policies, things like that. I felt like it was like so. I don't, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like the most polite way I could say it, but like, I guess just bad that yeah. uh it, it almost made me question like why even try and cover these topics you know if you knew that you weren't gonna or i mean i don't know if they knew that they weren't going to be able to cover it well but you know what i mean right no so uh, that's something i've always been really curious about when it comes to how we critique um the things that we enjoy especially like disney or marvel or you know any other company that kind of like covers topics because i don't think that we should totally absolve companies from being like uh irresponsible with their messaging but i also wonder like how much responsibility are we putting on them and why we're putting that responsibility on them it, because like there's so many different perspectives however i will say the critique is valid you should critique things um i, I guess my question is more of a um what are we what are what are our expect expectations of companies when they talk about these things you know what i mean right i get you um and that, that's not like definitely an easy question because i know like a lot of it is like how much of especially with Marvel properties and how homogenized they kind of are in terms of like their quality and having to maintain like a, like, you know, the brand, right? Like yeah. how much say that individual authors can have in their works. Well, well it's some exceptions. Like I think, um, usually, Oh my God, what's his name? Uh, he did guardians of the galaxy. How am I blanking? Oh, James, on this? James Gunn. Yeah, James Gunn, like, usually they give him, like, a lot of leeway because he's proven that, like, oh, yeah, his films can, like, bring in the numbers, right? right. But uh, obviously we know that a lot of Marvel projects have been on a type of crunch, so that's also affected, like, how they can approach these topics and things like that. Yeah, I think something that we acknowledge but don't consider, if that makes any sense, is how much the pandemic actually impacted things. So we'll say things like, oh, yeah, I mean, obviously the pandemic happened, so they couldn't do this, this, or this. But, you know, oh, why couldn't they do this, this, and this, like, in the next breath? It, it's, it's, uh, 
it's very interesting um only from the perspective of how we like i said how we critique things and um i definitely want to emphasize though it's not that we shouldn't critique things it's it's how we critique things is is i guess um what i'm getting right and i think um well, I think a lot of it too is that oh, we're just expecting a lot from Marvel because you know they own forty percent of the market. Yeah, they're big. So it's like you know yeah. they're the ones dominating the industry and they're the ones like dictating these trends. I, I don't think it's like mm -hmm. you know too far out there to like demand more from them. But I, I get what you're saying. No, right? I totally agree. Yeah, this whole uh, multiverse saga has, to me, not been not been good. It hasn't been clear. It hasn't been well defined um we don't really know where it's going i know that you know when marvel makes a lot of announcements like there's a uh, what secret wars and king dynasty are kind of like the end of of this phase four and five uh yeah four and five and i think six as well however as as we stand right now it's very confusing on how we're going to and not that we need not that we need to know every detail but you have to give us some kind of feel of what we're what we're going for right so for example in the infinity saga we knew these dudes had to uh these guys had to uh collect the stones keep them from thanos someone else was trying to get them and that's the big MacGuffin. like if if he gets those then it's a problem and we knew that kind of they kind of set those seeds from the beginning and right now i'm not really feeling any any seeds right now um so yeah it's, it's very very convoluted is the word i would i would use now i've talked about this take uh before and i've said that like one thing that i think would be interesting for them to do to kind of help with uh some of these problems is to stop committing to like these long phases. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, um, yeah. I guess I'm curious yeah. about like your take on, on something like that, like just committing to just like, like basically kind of doing what they're doing with star Wars, right? Where they've kind of moved away from trilogies in favor of like, you know, these like series, these limited series mm -hmm. or like, you know, longer like Mandalorian stuff like that. Yeah. So in terms, so, Talk to me more about this. So you're saying that it's um, not as advantageous to do the long phases. Is, is that what is that what you're saying? Well, I, I guess I should I should say that no. In terms of a business sense, like I will admit, Marvel's probably doing it right. I'm not gonna lie. Well, um, in terms of I like making money. <laughs> Well, no, in terms of making well, yeah, money, making like money, they, yeah, they gotta they squeeze that, it. Sure. Like they gotta squeeze this like rock dry so to speak mm -hmm. um but i think in terms of like creatively like we're seeing the effects of like this crunch on these shows especially um in terms of like the vfx and um you know things like that right right uh so i think just creatively it would do a lot better especially since like again pointing to star wars they've had like uh, unfortunately, I haven't seen it, but like Andor got nominated for an Emmy, uh, yeah. from what I've read, right? So I, I think like it's working well for them in terms of like with Star Wars. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think that like maybe you should have the same mentality for Marvel. Yeah. Um. So in terms of Marvel, I think the I think the I think Marvel's biggest issue, honestly didn't necessarily come from marvel itself um the disney plus situation i think was the issue entirely and here's the reason why i say that um one i don't know of many if any tv shows that are six episodes unless it's uh like on the bbc network right um they they typically do series that are like like i know there was one season of luther that was literally like two episodes um, but they do that stuff because they, they're essentially making movies and calling them episodes. But, um, but yeah, so the, the idea that you can tell a complete story in six episodes is, um, I don't think that that is a formula that works, especially since from the results that we've seen thus far, 
you would usually get to episode about four or five in a Disney Plus show, Marvel show specifically, and you're like, okay, so what is the central conflict? And it doesn't show up until episode four or five. And then in episode six, they have to resolve the entire thing. It's like, guys, there's not enough time to for the writers, for the creators to tell a full story. Um, so that's kind of like the production part of it. But I think the biggest issue that they have right now is they are, whereas in the first phase of like the Infinity Saga, right? There were no Disney Plus shows. So in order for you to ke- to keep up with everything, you had to go to the theater. And that's a pretty easy commitment considering it's somewhere between one and a half to three hours, right? If you're telling me, hey, if you're telling fans fa- and new fans, especially who are growing up now with Marvel being in the world for, I guess, what, 15, 16 years now? That, hey, not only do you have to watch all 33 of these movies, you also have to go over to Disney Plus and watch six episodes of this thing and 12 episodes of this thing and just to get a full picture. I think the problem came in when they started making it essentially mandatory for you to watch the shows as well as the movies. And now we have people like my dad. My dad's 60, 60 right? Um, he could catch up. He can keep up because everything's in the movies. My dad's not going to go on Disney Plus and watch uh, Miss Marvel. Um, not that Miss Marvel's a bad show. I actually enjoyed it. But I'm talking about from a fan perspective. It's just, it's a tough ask for you to separate all your concerns, like to separate everything like that, and then expect people to keep up. Right? So that's kind of what I, I think the structure of what they're doing right now is the problem. And I don't think that that was a Kevin Feige thing. I feel like it was a, a, a above him. Hey, we have Disney plus now we need you to develop shows for this platform kind of thing. Um, yeah. And then the pandemic. Hit. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I, so I get what you're saying. So it's not so much like this phase structure that we have, but the fact that like everything has to interconnect with each other, whereas before there was like not necessarily that need to, where it could just be like, oh, one scene or something like that. Right, yeah. right, exactly. It used to be, uh, I, sound, I sound like an old, an old man. It used to be back in my day. No, but it used to be uh, where if you... Uh, so let's take, um, did you see uh, Captain America Civil War? I um, did, yeah. So if you recall, that was the first time we saw Black Panther, and that was the first time we saw uh, Spider-Man, right? They didn't need their own, separate sh- their, their own separate show for us to figure out and find out who these people are. I mean, if you're a Marvel Comics fan and stuff like that, you probably knew who they were, but I'm talking about for the general public. Like, you didn't need a six-episode show to figure out who they are. You were introduced to them. This guy's name's T'Challa. This guy's name's Peter. Everybody knows Spider-Man. But um, um, this guy's name's Peter, and here they are. And the next time you see it, the next time you'll see them will be in their own movie that came out right after the Civil War. So it, it, was easy, it was easily accessible because it was in front of your face, and you weren't required to go somewhere else to to figure out who Miss Marvel is, you know? Um, and that's kind of why I feel things have been a little bit dicey structure-wise. Kind of shifting away from that, uh, I think, like, mm-hmm. your first YouTube video and the one that I kind of watched a bit more thoroughly to get, like, a general sense of your content was um, was uh, you covering uh, Star Wars Visions, right? yeah. And uh, yeah. like for myself, I, I've gone on Twitter to say that like visions is like one of the best things that I think um, Disney has done so far with the Marvel property outside of like Andor, because again, I haven't seen Andor, but I, I still feel confident in, in saying um, that. So it's nice to have somebody else that like also to some degree shares my love for Star Wars visions. Yeah, it's, uh, I love that format, the, the anthology series, so much that it pains me that so far it doesn't seem like we're going to see any of those stories continue. 
and those stories are ripe with like th- there's so much you could do with them and you know you said you watched the video so you know i have a general like hey can we please just get away from the skywalkers I mean, we've been doing this for a while you know um and their story is told the emperor came back for a third time um <laughs> i think we can uh or i'm not came back for a third time but the the emperor was the end villain of the trilogy for a third time and i think it's I think like visions gives us like the visions visions gives us the freshness that a franchise needs. These are, I guess what eight to 10 brand new ideas and they're well made too. Um, and as you know, like I mentioned uh, in that episode, the ninth Jedi is my favorite. And I think from like what I've seen is a lot of people's favorite uh, episode of that. And it's just full of, hey, this could be a series. And why aren't you making this into a series? Now, of course, I don't know like if there's contractual things and they couldn't come to agreements, but I think Disney has the money to pull that kind of thing off where they can pay a studio to make, um, to make something like that. So, um, yeah, man, Star Wars Visions is great. It's incredible. And I agree with you. I think... I mean, I have to like you know consider some things, but I think that it's it's probably the best thing that Disney Plus has done, period. Um, no matter like what they put out, I think Star Wars Visions is the best thing that they've made. Um, I'm trying to remember what my favorite one was. Uh, you're talking about Star Wars Visions too with the Ninth Jedi, right? No, that's the uh, that's the first one. So if you remember in the first um, the first batch of them. There was the there was a story of the girl who her father was a former Jedi. They used to make like lightsabers, and she ended up going up to the space station where the Jedi or Sith's uh, lightsabers would change color depending on I guess the the quality of their soul, so to speak. Like if you were a Sith and you had a dark, you were on the dark side, it would turn red like automatically it was that story where it was kind of like a mystery of who's the sith in this uh room kind of thing and i mean that that story was incredible um but yeah that's from the first one the second the second stands up stands the second group of um star wars visions was i think just as good to be honest with you yeah what, what would you say was your favorite one mm. Well, I, I usually break it up into parts. I think uh, for the first part, oh, man, I have to like think through all of them again. I really mm-hmm. like the Studio Trigger one, but I'm biased because I really like Studio Trigger. Um, Which one did they make? It was um, uh, oh, God. I'm trying to like remember the like the synopsis. Like it was like two. Like it was like a brother or sister. Like one was a Jedi, the other one was a Sith, and they were fighting uh, alongside yeah. like a, a, a like um. One of the tie based things. I don't know the name of yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. That was a fun one. That was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah. I think in terms of the second one, it was by the team that did the Secret of Nels. Uh it, it it's it's the second episode. I can't remember the name of it, but where like some kids are like discovering or like going into like this haunted cave and they find like this decrepit yeah. Seth Sith. Yeah. Um that one's my favorite, I think. That was great. Did you notice like a lot of the characters went to the dark side in the second season? Um, yeah, kind of. I'm it trying was, to. That's, it was really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I guess they were. Um, yeah, yeah. I guess now that I think about it, uh, it's either that or I do also remember liking. I think the last one, which had like um, I don't know what you describe the animation style. Like it's um. Like it emulates stop motion, but I know it's not, right? And it kind of has like the yarn design. It was with the girl and her dad. They uh, they basically um, mine Kyber, or I'm saying the name wrong, but like you know yeah. the, the crystals for the lightsabers. Yeah, and she has like this <laughs> voice that can activate like the crystals. I don't know if that you remember. Episode is so beautiful. That episode is so good. I literally cried during that episode. That it's episode amazing. Is so good. Yeah. And yeah, that, and, and even like the, 
the Jedi Master who came down and like just recognized her skills. Like, hey, she needs to come with me, and you'll probably never see her again. Um, but he had to let her go because that was her journey. Like that was that was a really good episode. Um, and there's a lot of stuff like that. The thing that I noticed across the Star Wars visions, um, well, most of them, uh, m- not all of them, but most of them, like there's a, there's a level of heart. There's a level of like heart to them. There's like a very emotional, like these are characters with like real thoughts, feelings, and emotions and how their world like interacts around them like you, you'll see a lot of them like have fear and a lot of them are experiencing like doubt and things of that nature and it's just like it's like really gripping because it's not just action 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 there's a lot of like character involved um in the way that they develop those like well characters um yeah so i i guess why do you think that marvel won't ever like or I don't know if I want to say like they never will, but why do you think they're kind of not jumping on these stories if they're seeing their like popularity? Um, oh, I'm sorry, you mean Star Wars, right? Um, yeah, in terms of like these vision stories, because um, like when you, like you want them to kind of expand. Like I'm with you. I also want them to I think expand on some of like the lore they're presenting here, and that you could. I'll say in theory, make good shows out of some of like these shorts. I, I know like things can sometimes get lost in I guess kind of the creative process where yeah. something might work as a short film, but until you actually um you know do it and then it doesn't pan out well. But um mm-hmm. I, I guess yeah. for but yeah, I guess for like these Marvel shorts, why do you think Marvel isn't like going for it? Yeah, I feel like Star Wars, like, so it's... Or Star Wars, sorry, I keep misspeaking. No, no, it's, it's all good. I, yo, I misspeak a lot. But, um, but it feels like... Um, I have two kind of theories about that. One is kind of pessimistic. Not, not necessarily pessimistic, but it's not what you would want to hear from a, a studio. And the first one I'll mention is... But the first one I mentioned is contracts, right? Um they license their IP out to these studios to create these ideas in order to make a long-term partnership with them. I feel like it would take a little bit more. I I think it's a little bit more work contractually than just essentially doing like a one shot or like a one, one off. Right. Um, So I think that's a problem, but I, I think the real issue is if these studios partner with us and they continue to make things better than us then how will we look to the general public if we can no longer produce things that they enjoy and if we're still trying to push skywalker stuff skywalker saga stuff and but over here it's way better quality stuff that's being made then how can we hype up the the skywalker stuff the skywalker stuff that we need to sell right and that's i guess that's a pessimistic view of looking at it but it really feels like the only reason why you wouldn't give the fans what they want in terms of like the fans are uh have an outpouring of yo these vision shows are great uh shorts are great make them into shows is that they don't fit into the narrative that you're trying to push. And I don't mean narrative like politically. I mean narrative like the Skywalker narrative. Like you, you, that, That's your bread and butter. And if your bread and butter ends up in someone else's studio, how do you protect yourself from that kind of scrutiny? And that's really what I think it is, because I can't think of another reason why you wouldn't say... Oh my God, they love the Ninth Jedi. Oh my God, they love um, the the one with the twins. We should we should give them that, right? Because then they'll come and they'll subscribe and they'll. Because isn't Disney Plus all about Disney? Disney Plus is the weirdest platform I've ever seen in general. But um, now I can explain that in a second. But like, don't you want people to continue to come back to your platform? So wouldn't it make sense to? continue to make new things. And if you don't have to do it with your own staff, wouldn't it be easier to just pay these people to do it? 
and then you can let them let them cook, so to speak. Like it's, I don't get it. And that the explanation I gave is the only thing I can think of. They don't want those other properties to overshadow what they're doing with the Skywalkers, whatever that may be. <laughs> you know, so um, that's really all I can think of. Well, I want to hear your explanation for the Disney Plus being a weird platform. But before we do, we have a word from today's sponsor, Salty Llama. Uh, Ken, have you had any issue with your laundry? Yeah, all the time. Well, have I got a product for you. Uh, today's episode is sponsored by Salty Llama. Are you tired of lugging around heavy bottles of detergent and dealing with the mess of measuring the right amount? Introducing Salty Llama. The ultra-concentrated, hypoallergenic, toxins-free laundry detergent strips that are revolutionizing the industry. Their eco-friendly strips are good for... Eh, wow, I misread that. Their eco-friendly strips are easy to use. Just toss one in with your laundry and you're good to go. With Salty Llama, you can say goodbye to harsh chemicals and hello to a cleaner, greener laundry experience. But it's not just good for the environment, it's good for you and your family. The hyper allergenic formula is gentle and sensitive skin, making it perfect for babies, kids, and adults with allergies. Don't just take my word for it. Give Salty Llama a try and see the difference for yourself. You'll be amazed at how powerful and effective their detergent strips are. Visit www.saltylama.com and order yours today. And don't forget to use the code PODCASTPASTA at checkout for a special discount. Again, that's www.saltylama.com. And the code is PODCASTPASTA, all one word, all capitalized. Um, I think it's like 10% discount, but uh, yeah, on with the episode. So go ahead and since we're on the Disney, we're on the Disney train already, entertain us with your thoughts of why Disney Plus is such a weird platform. I think Disney Plus is a weird platform because it's the only platform that's out there that seems to really operate off of really, really old IP. I mean, they do have originals outside of Star Wars and Marvel, but I would venture to guess that those are those IPs that they're making are not pulling in the type of money that Star Wars or Marvel would would pull in. Right. So they're literally just a library of the Lion King, my favorite movie of the Lion King and Aladdin and all these other things that they're making. And, you know, every once in a while, they'll, they'll pull in their movies like the, the new Little Mermaid will show up there at some point. But Netflix and Paramount Plus and uh, Hulu, they all have their originals that are pretty diverse in the types of stories that they're telling. And they're also of very high quality. And the only things that you can really bank on being new and high quality, hopefully, are the Star Wars and the Marvel shows. But even when you say like high quality, hopefully, like I just said, you know it's more high quality than any other uh, Disney Plus original thing that they're putting out. Um, so... It's real. It's weird. It's really weird to me because I think it's the only platform that's really nostalgia based, right? You can't. I'm not. I can't say you can't get, but for the most part, most of those classic Disney movies you can't stream them anywhere else. Whereas, like on another streaming service, uh, you can stream a movie from. Uh, Universal or Paramount or like if you go on Amazon uh, Prime, you can stream from all over different types of studios. Um, but and I mean streaming, not just like renting, just like stream. You can't like Disney Plus is weird because it's literally built off of super old IP and nostalgia. And if there, so let me put it like this: if there were no new Star Wars shows coming out and there were no new Marvel shows coming out. What would Disney Plus be but a library that you would have to decide whether I'd want to pay for this month? You know, so that's why I feel like Disney Plus is a strange, strange like um, platform because they're really banking on just two IPs or two properties. Right. And the example that I think I would give is. Um... The whole kind of this is like way back but um when they decided to put simpsons on disney plus and people were kind of 
like confused like wouldn't it make more mm-hmm. sense on like hulu because hulu which is also owned by disney because again disney owns 40 percent of the market right. um right yep but you know like it would make more sense on there and i think even for like they have this weird split thing where hulu hosts like the more modern episodes but like you right. know disney yep. plus hosts like more the totality of it and I, I think it does kind of tap into like just purely nostalgia baiting because they know people want a way to watch older Simpsons episodes. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, there's definitely a, I can't, I literally cannot get this anywhere else. Kind right. of situation going. Um, I mean, not to say that didn't pan out for them. Like I think a lot, like it did obviously boost their numbers in terms of like subscriptions and things like that. But, um, Oh, it definitely works. I don't know if I would have a Disney Plus subscription if they weren't putting out Star Wars and Marvel content. I think if I wanted to like watch Lion King again, I would can't, and that was the only thing I was trying to do. I would probably cancel Disney Plus, and when I wanted to watch it again, pay five dollars and just watch it instead of being paying. I I think it's like seven dollars now, paying seven dollars a month every month just. In case maybe I might feel like watching Lion King at some point, because other than Star Wars and Marvel, I really don't go on that platform. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, that's, I'm kind that's of just a, me. I'm just one person. No, yeah, I'm like kind of on a similar boat, except for occasionally I watch like older Simpsons episodes because you know they're like easy to watch while I eat or something. Absolutely. Um, Those first three seasons were gold. Yeah. Although you know, I will say. Um, and I, I wanted to talk to kind of uh, to see if I could find anybody that covers like modern Simpsons content. But uh, occasionally I watch it because, you know, it, it's like, again, it's like on Hulu and Hulu updates me when like all the like Fox animated shows um, mm-hmm. come out with a new season. And I don't know. I've been impressed with some of the newer stuff they've been doing. I, haven't, I honestly haven't watched The Simpsons I can't tell you the last time I watched a new a new Simpsons episode on purpose. <laughs> um, uh, like typically, it'd be right after like football goes off, and hey, a new Simpsons episode, and I might just be sitting there, and the Simpsons will be on. Um, but yeah, I can't tell you that it like it blows my mind that the Simpsons is older than me. Uh, the Simpsons was 89. I think the Simpsons started in 89. I was born in 90. And it's just like, it's still going. And that's just wild to me. I'm 33 and it's still, still going. Yeah, I mean, how, how would I say this? But uh, I, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, but no, I, I have been kind of uh, impressed with some, uh, like, don't get me wrong, it's still very hit and miss. Like, in terms of, like, recommendations, I don't know if I would recommend somebody to, like, wa- like do what I do and, like, keep up with it. Right. Because there are a lot of bad episodes. But, um, I don't know, it, it just seems weird to, like, completely dismiss it as, like, all bad, right? I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't. Um, I think that, especially for, like, someone like you who's been a fan of it for a very long time that it's always good when that thing that used to be great gives you something you know every once in a while you know it's just it's it's always fun you know um there's something to remind you of how good it used to be or how good it could be so yeah i would never like just dismiss it out of hand like it's not something i would watch personally but i want my biggest, my biggest thing is I want people to enjoy what they enjoy. So if you enjoy The Simpsons, I want you to enjoy the hell out of The Simpsons. You know what I mean? Well, speaking of long-running uh, programs that are that have been of debatable quality throughout the years, uh, recently mm-hmm. the Emmy, the, sorry, the Emmys announced uh, their nominations. Okay. Um, and I, I don't know if you've had a chance to look over that no, yourself. I, I only saw it through like Twitter posts. Yeah, so I saw like a gl- some glances of some things. I I didn't see the full list, but if you want to go through the, the list, I can't promise you I've seen everything. Um, but I can definitely tell you what I think about the ones I have seen. Well, like fair enough, I haven't seen everything either because you know um, 
if it if it's television that's like a lot more like time extensive mm-hmm. but uh I, I guess i want to ask you broadly um is there anything that from the nominations you've seen is there anything you're excited about like hopefully winning because i certainly have some on on my ticket but i, I guess i'm curious from your end I think su- Succession has a good chance of getting some getting some Emmys. Um, I know that. So I'm not an Emmys expert, but if there is a Emmy for, a, I feel like there is, and I could be totally wrong and sound foolish. I feel like there is an Emmy for like a singular episode, um, kind of thing, and I feel like if that is the case. Uh, what are you, have you watched Succession at all? I haven't, but I've wanted to. Okay, so I will not spoil it. Um, but there is an episode the in the final season that is very emotional, oh, and it's something that happens that's very unexpected, and it's so good. It's done so well, and the actors portray it so well that it almost feels like you're in the room. Um, that I I would be shocked if. Like I said, I don't know if they nominate it. I feel like they do nominate like a single episode kind of thing. They do. Um, they, they uh, did you just it. search for it right now? No, I think my brain is my brain is doing something. Um, okay, so I'm pulling up to complete this now. No, because I think um, I th- I think th- I, this is from like my memory. I think how they do it is that they do nominations like they nominate a single episode, and then based on the episode determines like you know um this is what categories you could be really applied to or it's something like that because i remember um it's a story like from the simpsons where they uh it was emmy's time and they did um i don't know if you've seen this episode but do you remember uh the treehouse of horror where homer basically goes into like a 3d world oh my god yes they submitted that, that in my mind. Yeah, they submitted that for an Emmy because they thought, oh, the you know the Academy will well not the Academy I don't know what the equivalent is for Emmys but they thought oh the the committee will basically be impressed by the three D effects of this episode and uh, they lost that year and wow. they were talking like in commentary that oh man instead we should have done a uh, Grandma Simpson you know the episode that introduced like Homer's mom. Because they said, like, oh, if wow. we had done that episode, we would have won. That's wild. I can't blame them for thinking that they could win for that Tree Treehouse of Horror horror episode. Because, I mean, even, like, I don't remember what year that was in the 90s, but Homer was walking amongst human beings, like, live in live action. And that was the craziest thing I, I think I'd ever seen at that point. Like, that was wild. I'm I'm still blown away by the way that they did that. It's not like they um Who Framed Roger Rabbit hadn't come out or anything like that. But it but for that show to do that and have like a full 3D rendering of Homer just because it wasn't like it, it was his cartoon self. It was like a 3D rendering of him. And it, it was that that is a great episode. But yeah. Um Yeah, so uh yes, yeah, so I'm looking at these nominees and what i can tell you is let's see because i did see one for animation that yeah it has like its own category yeah so uh gendy tarkovsky's primal is one of the best shows i've ever watched in my life um and i hear good things about it yeah it's up against the simpsons rick and morty uh intergalactic which i personally have never heard of before it's um, on Netflix. And, it's done by. Um, have you heard of uh, Le- the League of Legends Arcane show? Oh yeah, I that think show it's done by the phenomenal. same team. Yeah. Oh, uh, I might have to check that out because that League of Legends show. I had no relationship with the game whatsoever, but the show on its own strength is incredible. It's really well done, and I think didn't the show that show win uh, an Emmy? Yes, I th- I think Arcane won in the year it was nominated, yeah, and it faced yeah, like stiff competition too. I think it was going against um, oh, shoot, I can't remember what the other show was. Um, yeah, that was needs to come I, back. I think it might have been Cyberpunk, but I might be like Cyberpunk uh, Edge Runners, but I might be wrong. Yeah. That was a Netflix show as well, right? 
Yeah, they both were. So Netflix yeah. has been crushing it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, but that uh, Primal is unbelievable. Um, and the second season was its last, uh, and it ended really well um, for that show. Uh, the Simpsons is also nominated on here, so it's always to... nominated. It's like it's a give me yeah. at this point, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, when you're that long, when you're a staple like them, you know, it makes sense. Yeah, um, and you know, Disney probably puts a lot toward the for you consideration, you know, the for you or for your consideration campaign. So it right. helps a lot with that. So we got best actor in a comedy series. Yeah, Bill Hader for Barry. Barry's a phenomenal show. I haven't finished. You still count season. Barry as a comedy series? Nah, that's weird. It's a, it's a comedy. It's a comedy. No, come it's on. It's not a slapstick kind of comedy, but it's a it's it's comedic. <laughs> I haven't laughed this last season. Like I felt tense moments. I did not laugh this last season. Like, okay. come on. Yeah, so I only watched. I think the first two or three episodes of the final season i'm sorry if i was talking away from the mic um the first two or three episodes of the final season and of course it's it's always good but i i, I don't know why i haven't gone back to it um martin short for only murders in the building that's a weird one um that show was good it's really good but i don't know if it's nomination worthy uh jason siegel and shrinking i have not seen shrinking jason sudeikis and ted lasso uh i watched the first two seasons i have not watched the third i don't know sometimes like i watch shows and i have no idea why i don't go back to them or why it takes me so long to get back to them but i just haven't gotten back to it uh but uh jeremy allen white for the bear when you talk about not a comedy this is the weird one to me because the bear is not a comedy it's it's a drama with some comedic bits, but that show is in no way, shape, or form a comedy. Um, yeah, so that's strange for it to be in this character in this category. However, he's phenomenal, and he should probably win. Um, Who's the show actor is, for Barry? Uh, Barry's Bill Hader. Nah, I'm sorry, I gotta give it to Bill, my boy Bill Hader. Bill Hader. Yes. He, so, um, because I don't remember like where I left off in this current season of Barry, I will say that the final episode of the last season where he gets caught, like his performance was phenomenal. And also the writing for that was phenomenal because it did the one thing that it was brave in that it didn't do the thing that do you remember the show Dexter? Um, I, yeah, I haven't, I've never seen it, but, um, I heard like, at least with its original run, people didn't like how it ended off. And I, I know that like, I think revived oh, yeah, the it recently. Was terrible. Yeah. yeah the, the ending was really bad. Actually the final, I want to say three seasons were really bad, but, um, the thing about Dexter that got really kind of ridiculous and cartoonish at some points was um dexter and barry are very similar in that they are normal human beings working normal jobs trying to pretend like they're not serial killers right but uh dexter has comedic moments but it's a lot more dramatic um it's a lot more like vigilanteism in it if you will but the whole thing is he's a forensics uh cop he, he works in forensics um in the police station and he's committing all these murders and everyone, all the cops around him, uh, can't either can't figure out that it's him. Don't suspect that it's him. Or when they find out that it's him, they get taken off the board essentially. So, um, and I bring that up because they, they bent over backwards to find ways for Dexter to not get caught. And it was just really refreshing to see Barry like, yes, you would get caught. You cannot continue to do this and not get caught. Like that's impossible. Um, so I was kind of like relieved, but also worried because then I knew there was another season coming. I was like, so how are they going to do a season with him in jail? So I, I don't know because you know, I've only, like I said, I only watched the first, I think two episodes. Um, yeah. But um, I don't know if you want to keep going through it, but um, um, no, I, I just wanted to add that. Um, 
for me, I'm yeah. just hoping out for the Better Call Saul win. I think that there's a good chance that Better Call Saul will win just off the strength of a well, I, I've never seen the show. So oh I gotta put my. that up. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry, keep going. I, 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 did, I did watch Breaking Bad and I love Breaking Bad. Um I never watched you know what it was? I never watched Better Call Saul because I was like <laughs> spin-off. It can't be as and then all I've been hearing for the past however many years is how damn good it is. And I just never press play. I don't know why. I don't have anything against it. I got over my na- naivete of like, oh, it can't be good because a lot of people are saying it's good. I just haven't made you know what it okay, so here's what it is, right? Breaking Bad was so good from start to finish, right? It ended to me, it ended so well that the idea of going back to that well, uh, no pun intended, was just mind boggling to me. Even like the next Netflix movie that they put out, I was kind of like, I don't know if I want to go into this and potentially dilute like the experience that I had. So, but like, a, but just based on your response, like, like I mean, so many people have said, it's, it seems to be a really good show and eventually I'll, I'll have to get into it. And it's great that it's over because now I can just binge it without the pressure of somebody, you know, uh, coming out and spoiling or seeing like a spoiler on Twitter, uh, the way that, you know, spoilers fly um, and the same way that things come out. Um, but what was I talking about? Um, Emmys, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Breaking Bad, all you know, all that. Yeah, I think that uh, Better Call Saul, just based off his reputation. But the thing is, it hasn't won an Emmy yet. Really? Yes, that's like the mind-boggling thing. Like for six years, it's been like nominated, it hasn't won one yet. So this is like the year. Do you think they'll give them like a swan song Emmy? Um. But well, that's going to be hard to do, right? Because well, I I will say they are facing also ended. Yeah, they're facing stiff competition with like Succession. Um, I think like some of the other shows are like Yellow Jackets. Um, just a whole lot of like really strong shows this year. Um, yeah. So I I don't know. I'm just rooting personally for it because you know um, I, I think the team deserves it. Honestly, yeah, at this so- point. So drama series, we have Andor, Better Call Saul, The Crown, House of the Dragon. Whew. Well, yeah, it's, it's going to be tough, right? yeah. The Last of Us, which is great, but I don't think it'll win. Um, Succession, The White Lotus, I haven't seen it, and Yellow Jackets. I also have not seen Yellow Jackets. But um, yeah, it's got some tough competition. It's going to be hard for it might be easier for it to beat succession because i'm pretty sure succession's won in the past correct say that again succession they, they've won an emmy in the past i i believe i'm not sure i i i'm, I'm not sure if they have one i i feel like they sh- they probably did but um yeah i'm not sure yes yeah, one oh Best drama, which it's won two of the past three years. So I would say the su- succession is not going to win this year because they're not going to let them three P. Um, I'm, I'm talking like in sports, but they're not going to let them three P. Um, and I think Better Call Saul has a big mountain to climb with House of the Dragon. That's the one because mm. I don't I, I don't think Andor will win either. Um, because Andor, like to me personally, Andor is good. I don't know if it's better than House of the Dragon or The Last of Us or Succession. Um, yeah, that, that's a tough sell for me. I did enjoy the show. I did enjoy it. But I don't know if it's better than that. Um, what do you think? Like I, like, I also did enjoy House of the Dragon too. But mm-hmm. I don't know if I, I'm just stuck in my brain of like trying to compare it to like the earlier parts of like Game of Thrones, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But like, I feel like it's good, but I don't think it's like Emmy good, you know? Hmm. I oh. think. I mean, you could be right. I think that there are some Emmy worthy performances, but is the show itself as 
a whole worth an Emmy? That's uh, that's a good question. Um, like, I'm also mad but, that um, well, not like seriously mad, but um, apparently, yeah. Better Call Saul didn't get nominated for best cinematography, but um, that Wednesday Adam show did. Cinematography, really? Yeah. Like, and I mean, so no offense the, to the, the Wednesday Wednesday Adams yeah, show. Yeah. I watched but, the Wednesday show and I had a lot of fun with it, but cinematography is not the thing that I would consider it for. Yeah, and especially like, um, I'm, at least for me, Better Call Saul had like one of my favorite shots in all of like the Breaking Bad um, universe. And for those of you who, uh, I, God, I don't know if I want to like, if it's kind of like a. It is. I'll try and not be spoilery about it, but mm -hmm. I will say it's basically the confrontation between Mike Erman Trout and uh, Nacho's dad. So mm -hmm. a lot of you will know the scene I'm talking about, but I think that's like my favorite, like in terms of like the. I think in terms of like everything, in terms of how the shot was composed, in terms of like the performances, um, it just does a lot for me. But yeah. no, let's give it to Wednesday, you know, because meme Netflix no. show. I'm sorry. That's mean. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, there's some legit, like, Wednesday's a good show. Is it? Is it a top tier show? I would watch Wednesday season two in a heartbeat. But is it and or in terms of cinema, cinematography? I don't think so. So, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know about that. Why is the bear in best comedy series? I don't get it. I don't know. The Emmys yeah. are weird like that. Um, yeah. By the way, how much time did you have? I don't want to like keep you for too long. Oh, um, I say I got <laughs> all the time in the world. This is kind of a, I'm, the work is done for the day. So, um, you know, I, I mean, also I don't want to go too long if, if you don't want to um, go too long, but I could literally talk all day. Okay. No, no, not just too much longer. I, there's just like one more topic I think I want to like uh, cover oh, with sure. you. And that is um, because I saw you've been keeping up with, you know, you keep up with like a lot of movie trailers and we're mm -hmm. getting, I think next week, the big, the like the doomsday, so to speak, of uh, the Oppenheimer Barbie release. Yeah. Uh, so I guess um, what are you excited for? Both of them. <laughs> both of them. I'm excited for both. Yeah, I yeah. can't. I'm I'm one of the Barbenheimer uh, people. I I would like to see both on the same day. I I feel that's like that's crazy to me. I'm sorry. Yeah, I feel like it's such a because people are just really having fun with it, and I feel like it's just fun. I mean, it's fun. The funny thing about saying it's just fun is that Oppenheimer in and of itself. It's not a fun story, <laughs> but the idea of seeing the atomic bomb get made and then watching Barbie is funny as hell, or watching Barbie and then watching the atomic bomb get, being made. It's just such a fun, like, I don't, I saw today, actually, um, I was scrolling through Twitter, it's like, Christopher Nolan is upset that Barbie's releasing on the same day. Yeah, I read that too. I'm, I was like, I like Christopher Nolan a lot. He's got to get over himself sometimes. He sometimes he's just he just says things that are just kind of like. Now let me be fair to him. If I worked really hard on a film and I wanted it to have its spotlight and stuff like that, I get it. But they're, they're just, dude, you make entertainment. It's it's literally just entertainment. Now, I know it's art. But at the end of the day, art is supposed to do, I guess, two things. One, like, peak some type of thought, maybe. And two, entertain. So, did you have fun making the film Christopher Nolan? Yes. Then, every, and is, are a lot of people going to go see it? Yes. Then chill out, sir. But, like, that's, that's kind of... I'm sorry, I don't know how I got on the soapbox. But, um, but yeah, I'm... I'm excited, man. I'm excited for the. I might wear pink, man. I might wear pink, a pink shirt, <laughs> and like some dark brown slacks, and for just five like, hours, man. Yeah, five hours is a long time. Yeah, I will uh, give you that. Which is why I'll probably see it 
I usually see movies on opening night. On a Thursday night, I'm usually in a movie movie theater. You can kind of count on that. But because I want that experience, I'm probably going to have to move that to a Saturday, specifically a Saturday morning, because I will not be in the theater for five straight hours. I can do Barbie at like 11, 12 p.m. and then come back to the theater at like 5, 6 p.m. and then do Oppenheimer. I don't know if I'm doing that back to back. I might do them the same day. But back to back is kind. It's, it's a long time. It's a long it, it, You know what it reminds me of? Whenever a new Marvel movie comes out that's a sequel, and they say, um, yeah, you can watch, you can buy a ticket to watch Guardians of the Galaxy 1, 2, and then watch the third one in the same day. And as much as I love Marvel, I'm never doing that. I'm never spending <laughs> nine to ten hours in the theater. That's well, like the Lord I, of the Rings uh, re-releases where it's like, watch all of them. Oh, you're crazy. Yeah. And um, I'm glad that uh, your listeners are getting an exclusive uh, piece of information. I have not watched Lord of the Rings. Oh. Um, <laughs> what? The third so one's watched, tied for the most Oscars. Are you serious? I watched, um, uh, God, The Fellowship of the Ring. And then I was told, because I had missed some of the years that they came out. Then I was told that each of the ones that you, like, to really get the experience, you need to watch the four-hour versions. And just in my mind, I think about watching four four-hour movies, and I, my, I just can't get over that mental hurdle. <laughs> well, no one said I had to do it in the same day. But it's, that's, it's a lot. That seems like a lot. Four hours? Yeah, that, that is fair. Scorsese was like four hours and not i enjoyed it but i was kind of like hey uh can we wrap this up and that's how i that's that's the only i have nothing against lord of the rings i have nothing against harry potter like anything like that which i've only seen like three of those um yeah i have nothing against them it's just i guess the reason why marvel has me at movie 33 it's because I started at movie one and then I have some like back history of reading comics and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, th those other two are, um, they're probably really quality products, but, or projects, I should say. But uh, I just have not, I'm probably going to, because of the channel, I'm probably going to end up watching them. But, it's going to be a tough task because they're four hours a piece. Oh, no, the Lord of Rings are four hours a piece. And uh, Harry Potter's eight movies. What would be smart is that if I did a watch along of like all eight Harry Potter movies, I'd probably get a bunch of subscribers then. But I also have this kind of rule where I don't do what I don't want to do on my channel. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry. Sorry for that sidebar. No, no, you're good. Um, I, I think for me, I'm probably going to prioritize Barbie more admittedly. Not to say that I don't think Oppenheimer is going to be like a good movie. It's just, I, I feel like I know how it's going to like play out, you know? Right. Like, because I've seen other Christopher Nolan movies. I get like the gist of like, you know, how he shoots things. It's not to say that, you know, there aren't like differences between his films, but like mm -hmm. Barbie just feels like more of a wild card in like how good or bad it's going to be. And it just seems like a funner movie experience i agree and i have a i have a good feeling that is going to be really good and i just can't wait to experience it um and just and just have fun you know what i mean because that's the that's the thing oppenheimer is for oppenheimer's a different kind of fun but Barbie's just like, oh my god, I'm laughing, I'm enjoying myself. The entire crowd's laughing and enjoying themselves. Oppenheimer's going to be a quiet, depressing theater <laughs> experience. So I don't, I don't blame anyone for prioritizing Barbie at all. Well, this has been a lot of fun, and I could clearly pick your brain all day, but unfortunately we are a bit past the hour mark, and just for the sake of episode length, I have to cut it here but for all my listeners um 
listening here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. If you want to support the podcast, you could do so in a number of different ways. Uh, if you want to do a monthly subscription plan, I recommend Patreon because you get exclusive tiers, such as your name read at the end of credits, which would be here, but I don't have any patrons, so this section's blank. Uh, if you want to do one-time donations, I also have a Ko-Fi account. So um, you can also do monthly on Ko-Fi, but uh, again, I would recommend Patreon for like the tiered stuff. Um, I also have a merch store with merch designed by the great George Isaac of Nocturnal Essence. It's like t-shirts, stickers, it's really cool stuff. Um, all this is linked on my profile. I have a link tree. It's on my profile on Twitter at Podcasting Pasta. Again, that's at Podcasting Pasta, all one word. Um, P's are capitalized. I'm not sure if it matters for Twitter. Uh, Ken, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you want to shout out where people can find your channel, where people can find um, your social media, go ahead. Sure. Thank you so much for having me, uh, number one. Um, so you can find me at C or C for Yourself on YouTube. Uh, that is the YouTube channel where I have all my trailer, trailer reactions, movie reviews, general thoughts and um, a bunch of shorts as well and everything in between. Um, all of my social media is at C for Yourself. That's on Twitter, uh, Facebook now, uh, as of this week, um, Instagram and TikTok, uh, as well as I will be on Spill, a uh, new social media app as well. And I'm on Threads. So I'm on a lot of different things. Um, and I had to find time to post on each and every one of them individually. So you can find me at all those platforms. Um, but if you want to support me, subscribe to the YouTube channel, um, and come engage with me, talk to me about your opinions. And can I just say why the channel's called see for yourself real quick? Oh uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. So the idea of see for yourself came from, um, LeVar Burton and the show reading rainbow. And at the end of every book that he would share, he would say, but don't take my word for it. Um, and that's kind of the inspiration of the name see for yourself, which is no matter how much I love express how I love or hate a movie or, um, not rarely hate, but love or dislike a movie. I want you to go out and form your own opinion and go see for yourself, go and go experience it. What if I tell you that this movie is terrible, but you would have loved it, but you didn't go see it because I told you it was terrible. Don't do that. Hear my opinion, but go see for yourself. And that is the whole uh, concept behind see for yourself. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you once again for having me. Um, I really appreciate you uh, sh sharing your space with me. And um, I look forward to talking again if we have that opportunity. Oh, absolutely. Um, and well, yeah, thank you all for joining us. Um, again, thank you to Salty Llama for sponsoring the episode. And uh, yeah, just take care. Bye. All right. You as well. Bye.